happening family it's time to pray and we want to look at Romans 15 and verse number four again on today as we continue to unpack our discussion and our study on hope Romans 15 and verse number four the Bible says the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope and we've been looking at the idea of hope we've argued definitionally that hope is for the disciples an undeniable expectation and giddy anticipation of the move of God, regardless of or despite the physical consequences, despite the emotional turbulence, and despite the spiritual attack that's going on around the context of the believer. For the disciple, hope is directly correlated to the person of God. It is executed by the power of God, and one's resolve is connected to the nature of God. Hope includes for the disciple trust, belief, and obedience despite one's situatedness and because of your relationship with God. Now, we've looked at that definition. We've maintained it and argued it in the course of our study. We even went a little bit further. And in, the, in our discussion, you remember that we talked about the fact that our hope is in the object, not the outcome. Hope is connected to the object, not the the outcome. We practice a confident expectation and anticipation on the move of the object of our hope, not the many elements that may be a part of the outcome. And so the outcome is a part of the wisdom and the integrity of the object, who is God. When you understand the distinction that our fixation is on the object, God, not the outcome, then you won't worry about the outcome because you know the outcome is connected to the wisdom of the object. If the object says, I want the outcome to be through turbulence, through storm, through ups, through downs, through pain, through, through, through destitution, through suffering, through whatever, then you're not worried about the outcome. 
Because you already know that the object, God, is seeing it through. And when the object, God, wants to bring you to a place of what may be normalcy or regularity or peace or prosperity or any of those other things, then you know that where you are, your situatedness is based on the wisdom of the object. And so wherever you are, whenever you are, however you are, with whatever you've got going on, you know you have hope because you have the object and you ain't tripping out on the outcome. Oh, I hope you hear that. And when you can understand that, when you can practice what it means to hold on to the object, when you can see the object navigating and moving you through, then and you as you ride the waves of the human condition, you're not bothered by the ups and downs. You're not bothered by what seems to be down and out. You're not bothered even when you're up and you've got everything working for you. You know that the object of your hope is in direct control of the outcome no matter what the outcome may be. And so now we're at a place where we have to ask the question, how do we practice having this type of hope? How do we practice maintaining a sense of, 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 of uh, undeniable expectation and giddy anticipation despite the physical consequences, despite the emotional turbulence, or despite the spiritual attack that may be going on? How do I maintain a grip on the object of my hope when the when the outcome seems to be a, a different narrative than the than the character or my perceived character of the object. And so I want to argue even now that one of the ways that we need to do it is go right back to the text. So listen to the text. The things that were written are for time, before your time, right now, were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. One of the things that the disciple today is duty bound to do is to look at the thinking and the mentality of the disciple in time past. How did the disciple in what we call the Old Testament think about God? How did they think about hope? How did they practice their relationship with God? How did they practice walking in a state of hope? Here's my argument in three points. I want you to hold on to this. I want you to write it down if you haven't. Make sure you put it in your notes. Here, number one, the posture of hope is connected to how we process the object of hope. Number two, the object of hope is received when we remember the person. Number three then, knowing the person, God, shapes your paradigm. And your paradigm represents the lenses or the perspective by which you say every or by which you see everything else. Let me go over that one more time because I want you to get it. The posture of hope is connected to how I process the object of hope. Remember, the object is your God. The object of hope is received. We receive it when we remember the person of God. Now, here's what I'm saying in a nutshell. Sometimes what we have a tendency to do is dismiss who God is and just just allocate it or relegate it to being a notion. You treat God. When you treat God like a genie in a bottle, when you treat God like a, a, a concept, an abstract concept, then you remove him from being a person. But if he is a person and he is, then you know that that person is going to do what he said he's going to do. You can recognize and honor him and receive him. Now watch. When you receive him, number three, knowing, having relationship with the person shapes your paradigm. Your paradigm is the lens by which you see the life. It is that model and that construct by which you see everything else. And when you know the person of God, you put on the lenses of who your God is. And when you put on the lenses of who your God is, you see everything in your life according to those lenses. Those of you that wear glasses, you already know it. If you're nearsighted, farsighted, whatever sighted you are, you already know 
That if you can't see far off, then the worst thing for you to do is to take your glasses off and try to cross the street. You can't even see cross the street if you ain't got your glasses on. Those of you that can't see things, little bitty things close up, you already know your arms ain't long enough to get, get the right perspective on what it. Child, hold it. You, you need me to hold it? You, 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 you can't get the right perspective if you won't have them lenses on. You've got to learn how to have the lenses on. Now, see this. When you don't have the right lenses about who your God is on your spiritual eyes, you will see your physical world through the wrong perspective. You will let people and emotions and things and culture and situations and COVID and bad systemic racism and government and brokenness and economic disparity, all of those things, you'll see them through the wrong lenses instead of remembering that every time you hear the name God, every time you hear Jehovah, every time you hear the Lord, every time you hear Adonai, every time you hear El Shaddai, every time you hear Jehovah Rophi, it ought to download something in your spirit that makes you see the world from a different vantage point, from different lenses. You ought to see yourself differently, see your neighbors differently, see your situation differently. Why? Because you see it through the lenses of hope, not through the pessimism or the downcast posture of someone who does not know your God. When you know God, everything about your life changes. Now y'all quit playing because I got to make this point. What does that mean that when, when they, when they, when they, when the disciples of old heard Jehovah, when they heard God, when they heard Adonai, when they heard the Lord, everything about them change. You, you download in your working conscience something that makes you recognize the person of God. Now hear me on this. You, when you and I hear God, something in your working conscience ought to be downloaded for you to realize the significance of who your God is because your hope is lived through the reality that God is. You got to hear it. When you hear, when they heard God, they thought about the resume, the track record, the power, everything they knew about God. And when you and I hear God, something ought to download everything that you know about God ought to download in your working conscience to recognize the significance that God is. God is what God is your creator. God is a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. He's a light in the darkness. God is the one who made the world out of nothing. Who heals from a distance. Who makes the lion have locked jaw. Who feeds a widow with a miracle. Who opens up wounds. Who causes death to back up 15 years. Who can cause the sun to pause for 8 hours. God who rides on the clouds. Parts water. Walks through water. Turns water into wine. God who can sing a lullaby to a storm and make it back up. God who can cause individuals to make who have a demonic mind to sit in their right mind. God who can straighten up crooked places, cause legs that haven't walked to skip. God can feed thousands with just a little bit. God who can raise the dead. God who can beat sin, beat Satan, beat the best that life can throw, can go down into the grave, whoop Satan, take the keys, get back up again. God who's the one who walked in the world, who put on flesh, who was manifest in our world and we saw the glory of heaven, God, who is the one who's given the name above every name so that every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess God, who's the one we are saved in and no name under heaven is given among men whereby we must be saved. There's something about the name of God and when you hear it, you ought to be downloaded with the reality that when I've got my God, I've always got hope, always got hope. Now watch, watch what it does, watch what it does. When you and I can recognize that we ought to have a certain perspective, a certain paradigm, when you hear the name and have a relationship with the object, then your paradigm for hope is regardless of the outcome. Now watch what that does. When you practice that, you are practicing hope in a way where your paradigm is in the driver's seat. Now here's where we need to be for today. I want to share this with you. Three things, or just, just one thing in particular. Your, your practice of having a paradigm of hope. That's what I'm after right now. I need you to see this. A paradigm of hope says this. That my faith and trust 
are concrete and personal. The, my faith and trust are concrete and personal. And nothing can move the expectation that I have that God will see me through. When you have a practice, a, a paradigm of hope, you are saying that your faith and your trust is your personal practice. It is your concrete personal expectation that God will see me through and nothing and no one can remove that hope from me. It is your ongoing practice, this concrete personal practice. I want to underscore the word personal because your personal hope is not contingent on anybody else. And that's what the Bible is teaching. Put these three passages down in your note. Isaiah 8 and verse number 17, Micah 7 and verse number 7, and Psalm 42. Listen to the text. The Bible says in Isaiah 8 and verse number 17, I want you to see this. The Lord has hidden himself from his people, but I trust in him and place my hope in him. That's Isaiah 8 and verse number 17. Now the reason why that's important is because what Isaiah is doing is he's making a contrast that's mentioned earlier in the verse. Earlier in the verse, if you go back and read, you go back and read it at verse number 12, you are not to say it's a conspiracy like everybody else says. You are not to be afraid of what everybody else is afraid of. It is the Lord of hosts whom you regard as holy. You should only be afraid of your Lord. You should only dread your Lord. You shall not worry about him. He is the rock. He is a stumbling place. He will be the one who is your sanctuary. You go back and read that text very clearly. Watch what Isaiah is saying. Isaiah is anchored in verse number 17. Or that's his posture. The Lord has hidden himself from his people, but I trust him and place my hope in him. I'm not like everybody else. Watch the argument. Your personal concrete expectation will not be compromised by the culture. I won't be afraid of what the culture is afraid of. I won't call conspiracy what the culture calls conspiracy. I'm not tripping out on what the majority trips out on. Just because everybody else is afraid and worried and have their head hung low. I'm not going to do what everybody else. Now, y'all come here, come here, come here. Because watch what that means. That'll stop you and I from having a mob mentality like the world around you. You won't get all up and out of, out of place when everybody else is up and out of place. Your spirit will be anchored because you've got a personal, concrete expectation that the object of your hope will see you through. But let me give you the second one, Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. Come on. Micah chapter 7. Turn over there with me. Micah chapter 7. That's to the right. Micah chapter 7. In verse number 7, the Bible says, But as for me, I will watch for what the Lord will do. I will wait for God who saves me. I know that he hears me. A second thing that you want to see in this, in this, in this notion is that your, your personal expectation, your personal concrete expectation to, that, that God will see you through is not only not based on the culture, but it's also not based even on those that are close to you. In Micah 7, he, he makes the statement in verse number 7, But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. I, I will wait for God who saves me. I know that he hears me, the easy to read version says. But just above that, in verse number 5, he says, Do not trust the neighbor or have confidence in a friend. From her who lies in your bosom, guard your lips. For son treats father contemptuously. Daughter rises up against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies are the men of his own house. What is he doing? He's arguing. He's making this distinction that you, you don't put your confidence or your trust or your hope in anybody. You don't trust your friend. You don't trust your spouse. You don't trust your children. You don't trust your mother. You don't trust your grandmother. You don't trust your mother-in-law. You don't trust your father-in-law. What's his point? His point is you are not putting your hope in anybody, whether if they're close to you or they're the culture, your hope, your confident 
expectation. Your concrete personal expectation is that your entire self is rested in the move of your God. I'm putting everything in on God. Not the culture. Not close relationships. And then number three, Psalm 42. Not even my own self. I don't even trust me. I don't hope in me. I don't hope in the culture. I don't hope in close relationships. I don't even hope in me. My Watch it because there's, there's a conflict. My personal concrete expectation that God is going to move is not based on me. Why? Because the one somebody. Y'all come here. Come here. Come here. The one somebody who can mess up my ability to have faith and trust and watch the move of God really isn't the culture. And it really isn't a close friend. The one somebody who knows me better than anybody else. Who knows the secrets on how to make me break. Who knows the inner deep dark things that I fear. And the inner deep dark things that can trip me out. That voice that speaks to me when ain't nobody else around. That one that keeps you up to 2 and 3 in the morning. And wakes you up and whispers something crazy in your mind. And has you ruminating on that all day long. The one that makes you walk through the door and wonder. Did I breathe in the virus today? Did I touch so and so? So and so was coughing mighty crazy. Is that me? The one who can who can cause you to be all over the map in thinking about that. It's not somebody else. It's not somebody in the house. It's the inner voice of you. You, the inner you, is the one that can cause you to be at most out of order. And that's why God is saying you've got to give you and your spirit, give it over so that your personal concrete expectation isn't based on how you emotionally feel. It isn't based on how those that are close to you feel. It isn't based on what the culture feels. You are basing your confident, concrete expectation that God will see you through. Not in the outcome, not in close relationships, not in culture, not even in your own personal spirit. You are basing it on God and God alone. Psalm 42 and verse number 5, the text makes this statement, Why am I discouraged? Why am I restless? I should trust you, Lord. I will praise you again because you Help me. Go back and read all of them when you get a chance. Go back and read all of Psalm 42. I dare you to read it. Read it in the common English version of the Bible and you'll see him talk about how the sorrows flood his heart. When I remember different things, I'm restless and I've got these, these inner issues deeply discouraged. What's the point? The Sometimes the inner you is the worst enemy against you, but watch your posture. My hope and your hope, our hope, is seen through eyes that are shaped by the person of God, when you know who God is, that God is your creator, your way maker, your miracle worker, your, your, your light in the darkness, your God, that is who he is. When you know that about your God, then everything about your life is anchored in his ability to bring you hope. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you and we bless you for being our God. We honor you for all of what you've done. We magnify you for being the one who sees us through even in these most difficult moments. God, I pray even right now that you bless your people with a confident expectation and anticipation of your move. Thank you, Father God, for being the one who remains the object of our hope. And thank you, Father, for facilitating and seeing us through whatever the outcome may be. God, I pray that you continue to heal, strengthen, and renew. I pray, Father God, that you deliver us every single moment and do it, Lord God, just for you. I pray that you heal and deliver, strengthen, Father, and bless the people that are trying to navigate the difficulties of this world. Father, we honor you and we bless you and we praise you. We ask that you help us to live out this concept of hope and live out this concept of trusting you regardless of what's going on. Help us, Lord God, to actively live in that definition. Help us, Father. To practice what it means to trust in you as the object and help us, Father, to have a personal, concrete expectation that's not compromised by the culture, not compromised by those that are close to us, even in our own homes, and not compromised by our own inner conscience. Help us, Lord God, to anchor it on you and you alone. You are our object of hope 
Help us, Lord God, to not get eclipsed by the outcome, whatever it may be. We love you, we honor you, we bless you, and we praise you. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus as we ruminate, think about, meditate, and see the power that he has in his name. And here's alone, we together say amen and amen. Listen, have hope. Remember who your God is. Remember to walk in the power of who your God is. And let him see you through regardless of what you are dealing with. Listen, I'm going to pray for you. I'm asking you, please, pray for me. And let's watch our God change everything around us. God bless you and God keep you. Walking in sunlight. Yeah, yeah. Over the mountain, over, over the, the mountain, mountain. The roof, to the deep end. Yeah. Don't you know that Jesus has said, I, well, the Lord said, I never leave you. Oh, Lord, that's a promise, divine word, a promise that never can fail. Oh, oh, oh heavenly, heavenly sun, y'all will look like we do. Oh, heavenly sun. So divine, oh Lord, but each and every day of my life, gotta keep rejoicing, gotta keep on singing His praises. Cause my Jesus is mine. Listen, oh shadows around me, and even though there are shadows of me, Lord, it never consumes my Can be found oh, on the Oh God, that's why I'm walking so close, close to His side. Oh, 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 heavenly, heavenly, heavenly sun. Now the light is good. Oh, heavenly sunlight, sun. the keeps flooding my soul, flooding my soul with His glory. Glory divine, so divine. Keep on singing his praises to my Jesus in my life. I in the bright sun. I'm ever rejoicing. Oh, when I'm pressing my way on to those mansions of God. Oh, Lord. Oh, when I'm singing his praises and gladly.
Sim.